we have a lot of different things to talk about. You remember we talked about the French and the British and the Spanish and the, what was going on in China and all the different empires and colonies and the United States. And we want to kind of wrap it up and find out where those stories end, like where it goes, you know? So um, what I'm going to do is actually, about, since we, we, we stopped the last time talking about uh, China, actually, it was, it was our last topic last time. Um, you remember we talked about the Canton system. And um, so I'm going to start with that now. Right? We ended with China last time. We're going to start with China now. And then we're going to move back to the other colonial powers. And I'm going to say a little bit about China at the end as well. All right. So what happened? We me remember we said that there was this old China trade between the U.S. and China. And then also all these European countries, 13 of them had their uh, hongs, right, where they could trade in the city of Guangzhou, Canton. And everything was going okay, but it was very much controlled by China, right? China was able to, the government of China was able to dictate um, what the price was going to be. And they were only accepting silver. In other words, the Europeans were not allowed to trade anything else. They wouldn't bring stuff in and trade it, just silver, that's it. So I'm going to kind of give an over, just an overview of this. Basically, the Europeans, after a while, um, especially the British and then the French, um, saw an opportunity to make more money, basically, in China, to make become more wealthy through China, because China has such a large population. And if you recall, we said the British were over here. Now, this map has a big square over top of it, but here's India over here. Okay, we said India was the jewel in the crown in the British Empire, and also Burma was like part of that. Okay, so what they were doing over there was they were growing opium, which is drugs, okay, like addictive drugs. And they wanted to be able to send that opium around not that far away to China, especially the like southern coast of China, you know, from like, from like Hong Kong today up to like Shanghai, that area. And because they saw an opportunity to make so much money doing that. But of course, China didn't want them to do that, but the British did it anyway. Okay, so the British started to try to sell opium in China successfully, and a lot of people in China got addicted to opium. This is a major problem in China, in, in, in the world. And so people in other places, too, addicted to opium in America and other places as well. Famous poet Edgar Allan Poe was an opium addict. Um, and so after a while, the British uh, were not accepting the Chinese rules, and they forced their way in kind of like kick down the door, you might say, um, through the first and second opium wars. Okay, this is like the 1830s, 1850s, two, two different opium wars. And also then the French got, in, got involved later. Okay, so to make a long story short, if you recall, we said the British had the Industrial Revolution, which we're going to see in a second. They had machines. They had like uh, much better uh, technology. And so they could just have like naval ships sitting off the coastline of Guangzhou and other parts of Guangdong, and they could just launch, you know, cannonballs and, and ammunition in there and uh, bombard the Chinese, you know. So um, after a while, uh, the Chinese surrendered. And they said, okay. And um, they made a treaty, which is the first of a series of what's called the unequal treaties. That's the name the historians give to it, the unequal treaties, a series of treaties that were unfair, completely lopsided, okay, in which the Europeans got basically... Uh, the rights to trade all over China um, and pretty much do whatever they wanted, okay, for, for for decades to come, okay? And it says, if you notice here, by the late 1800s, 90% of males were addicted to opium from Hong Kong to Shanghai. So what that means is that, let me move this box out of the way here. Um, if you look in this map here, you can see... Here's Shanghai over here. Here's Hong Kong down here. If you go up this coastline, 90% of the Chinese males were addicted to opium. Okay, and it's very addictive. And if you stop using it, it's, it, you feel terrible, you know, so it's a highly addictive thing. And the British were making lots of money off this. You remember we saw the, in India, we saw these big pictures of people packing opium in the last class, right? That's what they were, that's where they're selling it in China. Okay, so this is the unequal treaty the Treaty of Nanking that opened China to trade with the West, okay, and gave also gave Hong Kong to the British. There wasn't a lot of stuff in Hong Kong, like we said. It was mostly just, you know, trees and 
stuff like that. It wasn't like there was a huge civilization in Hong Kong. The British built most of that stuff later. But um, later, the U.S., the France, uh, Germany, Russia, all these other, Japan, all get into the act. Okay, all get into this this uh, unequal treaties and got the rights to an area of China in which they could trade. Okay, so like each one, see the bottom here, it says Russian, British, French, German. Okay, so they call these spheres of influence. It's like trading territories. Okay, like, like uh, uh, this is the area that that country can trade in, that empire. Okay, so the Russians could trade up here, so it's Russian. The British could trade in here, the French, and then the fr uh, down here. So does it mean that there were British people all across this area? No, it means that that was the area that they could trade in. Um, if you've been to Shanghai, you know there's large parts of Shanghai which are built by the British and French. It's called the French Concession. Uh, in fact, the, the Bund, the main, the most famous part of Shanghai, the, the waterfront is built by the British. Um, and the Germans actually built uh, like a lot of the center of Qingdao. In fact, the the most famous Chinese beer, Qingdao beer, you know, you've probably seen it in the green bottle. That's actually, you know, same as Qingdao. It's the same Qingdao, another spelling of Qingdao. That's actually a German, started as a German beer, the German brewery in Qingdao, and then later taken over by Chinese. So China's most famous beer is actually a German, German company that later became Chinese. Um, and there's little leftovers of all these things, right? Like we said, there's French churches in Yunnan still. And uh, it's obviously Hong Kong is still speaks English today, along with Cantonese. So these spheres of influence were colonial, almost like colonies, but they're technically called uh, colonial spheres of influence. And this was bad. It was bad for China. Uh, I mean, some people made a lot of money in China. It's, for, it's not you know not bad in that sense, but it's bad in the sense that um, it was very unequal and also. Um, the drug addiction part was really bad. And so uh, the, the Europeans had basically like diplomatic immunity, which means that they could pretty much do anything they wanted in these series of influence in, inside of these territories. And they were not subject under the treaties. They were not subject to Chinese laws, just their own laws. So they could get away with all kinds of stuff. Okay, so it was really bad news. Um, this is picture of you know the opium situation people this opium they smoke out of these pipes and stuff and it just became a major thing within Chinese culture to to smoke opium not only in China but if you look at pictures of like New York City or Boston or San Francisco the Chinatowns and all those places uh you will see the opium smokers there too and even people who weren't Chinese would go there to smoke opium to Chinatown in Boston to Chinatown in New York City they were like the opium dealers, you know, for the city. So the very strange thing that happened that this British opium uh, managed to get all these people in China hooked and then it got spread around the world to other places this way. Okay, so that's a very bad period uh, in terms of like the Chinese situation. And meanwhile, the dynasty in China is the Qing dynasty, Q-I-N-G, right? Qing, also known as the Manchus. The guys with the long ponytails, right? These guys. Um, and if you watch Chinese television, obviously you see a lot of the, they still have the dramas, right? The shows on TV where they have people dressed like this, like this style. Um, Manchus or the Qing. That's going to be the last dynasty of China. So what happens? Well, I'm skipping over the Boxer Rebellion. Okay, the lady, the, at the turn of the century, about 1900, there was this huge uprising of Chinese people against the foreigners and called the Boxer Rebellion. It wasn't totally successful, but it was a sign of things to come, okay? So basically, by 1911, um, the people in China had, was, it became obvious that that, you know, government, the Qing Dynasty, was not able to protect China from all these outside powers. You see, basically, their, their China was carved up into these spheres. So obviously, the government was not able to keep them out with the foreigners or keep them under control. So there was a revolution in China. And this is where China actually became a democracy. Okay, China was a democracy led by the guy on the left, the Sun Yat-sen, the father of modern China. Even now today, the China became communist is still, they respect this guy named Sun Yat-sen. 
Okay. And so uh, to tie it with the democracy for several decades, actually, uh, you know, from 1911 um, up through um, basically the Japanese colonization, which is going to come up in a second. Okay, and the name of this party is not the Communist, but the Nationalist Party. And Sun Yat-sen was a, what you call a nationalist. He wanted to, why nationalists? Because the very problem that they were trying to solve is the fragmentation of China. See how it's all chopped up in pieces? And that was the, you know, the problem with the Qing dynasty is they couldn't keep all the pieces together. And even now, if you know anything about what's going on in China, the main goal of the Chinese Communist Party is to have unity. They don't want the country to break up. It's a really big country, right? So they're always trying to keep the country together. So hence the name nationalist, like one nation, one country, the Nationalist Party under Sun Yat-sen. Um, and strangely enough, you know, China was an ally of the United States uh, very much, you know, for a lot of this time, right? Yeah, once they become a democracy. But... China then became taken over later, skipping ahead two decades. After two decades of democracy, the Japanese, you probably know, expanded their empire. Japanese were heavily industrialized. Um, they were the first major industrialized power in Asia. Okay, Japanese, they modeled themselves after like British and US back in the middle of 1800s. And so um, they were a couple of steps ahead technologically than everybody else in this, in this region. And so they were able to colonize all of these things that you see in, in this color, whatever that is, orange or whatever, okay, including a lot of China and all down the coast especially. And this lasted all the way from 1931 all the way through World War II, which ended in 1945. Okay, and you probably know the Japanese fought with the Nazis in, in World War II. It's called the Pacific Theater of the War over here. And then there was the European Theater in Europe. There's also an African Theater too. So um, I'm just going to kind of skip over the Japanese empire. Okay, that last, that was very bad. A lot of bad things happened during the Jap Japanese occupation of China. But of course, the Japanese lost World War II, just like the Nazis lost World War II. And, you know, the U.S. dropped two atomic bombs on Japan. And that was because Japan had just refused to stop attacking. You know, they said, all right. So we dropped two atomic bombs on them, and then that was it. Um, so what happened? Well, like so many countries in the world, after you know the, the colonial powers pull out, right? The Japanese pulled out of China, pulled out of Malaysia, pulled out of Vietnam, et cetera. What happens a lot of times when, when the colonial power pulls out is there's what you call a power vacuum. Like nobody knows who's supposed to be in charge now or multiple groups want to be in charge. Now that the colonial power is gone, now who's in charge? We're going to fight over it. And that's what happened. The old Nationalist Party that we just talked about, Sun Yat-sen's party, he's, he's gone now, but his party. And then this Communist Party with this guy named Mao Zedong on the right, who's on all the money in China today. They had a civil war, the Chinese Civil War, which technically is still going on now. It never ended. right? And like we said last time, this war went back and forth. And actually, the Nationalists looked like they were going to win. But famously, Mao, you know, kind of re retreated up into the mountains with his people, and then they came, they kind of made a comeback, and then they took over the country. Okay, and so, long story short, China became this communist country in 1949. Communists defeated the nationalists. It was just four years after the end of World War II. And the nationalists, where did they go? Did they fly off into space? No, they fled to Taiwan. Okay, they filled up Taiwan and. That's what Taiwan is. It's nationalist people who uh, lost the Chinese Civil War on the mainland. But like I said, even today, the, the Taiwan question or the conflict is that both of them say that they are the rightful rulers of all of it. Right? So the mainland China says that China is ours and so is Taiwan. That's just part of China. And Taiwan says, no, Taiwan is actually the, the rightful ruler of Taiwan and mainland China. The war never really ended. Okay? All right. Um, so the Taiwan question is very, you know, up in the air type of a thing. Because what, what happens with Taiwan is that it's it has its own government today, its own separate government. It's like a democracy. But it the problem is it's not recognized as an official country in the United Nations because uh, China is a member of the Security Council, the five biggest countries in the Security Council, and they have a veto power. They can say no to anything. So whenever it comes up, like, should we accept Taiwan? 
as a nation, they, they just say no, and then nothing happens. So, <laughs> so it just gets stuck in this it's a weird situation, it's a very strange situation. Like, what is Taiwan? All right. So that's that's kind of what we could keep going into modern China and what happened under Mao, which I encourage you to look at. Maybe we'll look at that in our next next class, next session. But let's get back to the European colonization and everything else. We'll leave you right there. Um, all right. There's something we didn't talk about last time from the from the colonial life, which is the Colombian exchange. And I know it was in the homework, which I'm going to take a look at. This is just to be clear. This is not just stuff that Columbus exchanged himself. It doesn't mean this, this Columbus was doing the exchange. It means that it's everything that was exchanged back and forth between the old world and the new world uh, after the arrival of Columbus in the new world, 1492. Okay, so that for hundreds of years, these things on the screen that you see were traded back and forth from peppers to onions to cows, and especially all these diseases. So what happened was all these diseases over here, Europeans had developed immunity to a lot of these diseases. They were in the animals. Diseases were in their animals, like horses and you know cows and goats. Those are disease magnets, like they hold a lot of diseases. But whereas Europeans had a lifestyle which was living close to animals, which gave them a lot of advantages, right? Because animals, you get meat and milk and and uh, hides, you know, and um, the animals fertilize by going to the bathroom all over the place. So. But the Native Americans didn't have that. They were they didn't domesticate a lot of big animals like that. They were hunting animals, like running after buffalo, but that's not the same as living next to them. So they had not developed immunity. And so when Europeans came to the New World, the Spanish, for example, Native Americans that came near them, they often died like within weeks. And no one could they thought they had magical power. They thought people with white skin had magical powers. To, you know, people just die after after being around them, you know. And of course, it's not true. In actuality, what it was was they were just full of diseases that they had developed uh, immunity to over time. Okay, but all of these big animals, cows and sheep and horses, all that stuff comes from comes from uh, the old world. It wasn't it wasn't there already. There was no major domesticated animals anywhere in the Americas, except maybe the llama in South America. But you, they weren't. That wasn't like a big thing, you know, for food and everything. Okay, so some of these products, it's amazing if you think about it, you know, like think of all the people who, in the world who smoke today, okay, but tobacco comes from the Americas, right? Think of all the potatoes, like the Irish potato famine, but potatoes don't come from Ireland, they come from the Americas, right? All the stuff for Thanksgiving, like turkey and squash and pumpkins, and those come from the Americas. But at the same time, think of all the sugar plantations and banana plantations in places like Brazil and Ecuador today. Well, they don't come from there. They come from somewhere else. They come from India, actually, far, far away, some of these things. Okay, so it's amazing how all the coffee grown in Central America and Mexico and Brazil, that's not from there. It comes from far, far away. Okay, so there's this big interchange that changed the world's diet and their farming and their diseases and uh, lots of other things, too. All right. Well, it's going to go forward. We're going to start talking about revolutions, and the revolutions – Start maybe with a revolution up here, right? The Enlightenment. It's a period um, of like major, like you know, thinking, intellectual development uh, between the late six, maybe the 1700s, especially late 1600s to early 1800s. Right in the 1700s is the core. What I'm going to tell you in just a moment is that the American Revolution, which you know initiated the United States, in a way is a product of the Enlightenment. It's a product of the of the European Enlightenment. Because the U.S. government and the U.S. system is actually uh, almost like a case study in Enlightenment thinking. Okay, Because these guys like Thomas Jefferson and Washington and Ben Franklin, they were all reading European books, European Enlightenment stuff. So it's the period of rigorous intellectual and philosophical development in Europe um, with the emphasis on using reason to solve problems, okay, I'm using reason to make life better, reason to cure diseases, reason to make people happy, reason to have progress, all these types of things, reason to advance freedom and liberty, okay, using reason, the idea that reason could do it all. Uh, at the end of the Enlightenment, there'll be a kind of romantic period, you might say, where it's okay, there's more than reason, but it doesn't mean this reason is not important, but there's uh, something else too, besides other things besides reason. Like Plato said, the ancient Greek, 
he thought we had a three-part soul, reason, spirit, appetites. That's a typical model, right? So reason is not the only thing. But we're talking about, you know, this is after the invention of the printing press. So all these different thinkers could then write their stuff down and then send it all over Europe. So guys in England could read what French guys were, Descartes were saying down here, and French guys could read what Locke was saying in England, and they could have like a, arguments and debates this way. And they also had arguments and debates. This is where coffee houses became big. People would sit around in France and get high on caffeine, you know, just drinking coffee after coffee, and then argue about stuff and then write it down, okay? Um, one of the major kind of uh, points of difference within the Enlightenment is the idea between, it's not the only one, but is, is empiricism versus rationalism. To be empirical or empiricism is about basing your arguments off of real world evidence, observable evidence. Okay, we can see that it's true or not from the world of sensory experience, right? The world we see before us and smell and touch and everything else. John Locke over here was a empiricist. He's important because his ideas form a lot of the founding of the United States. We'll see in a second. Uh, the, the other side, you have rationalists. Rationalists believe that, yes, there are essential experiences, but you, you're, you can arrive at truth through just reasoning through things up here. Okay? And if you remember before, we saw hundreds of years before this, right, um, the uh, Francis Bacon, remember him? The ants and the bees and the spiders. So these are the, these are the ants and the bees, right? Some people are ants and then bees, uh, spiders, rationalists, and then the bees have to be both. So really, in truth, you need to be both. You need to use empirical evidence and also rationality. But some of these guys tended to favor one more than the other. So what about this American Revolution? Well, the United States was born in 1776 on the 4th of July. Okay, why was it born on that date? Because that's the date that Thomas Jefferson uh, wrote on the left, the Declaration of Independence, which literally did exactly what it says. It declared independence from England. It said, we are no longer a colony, we're now a country. But the more important thing about it in terms of philosophy is the why part. This, why did they say that? What, what justification did they have? Was it because we feel like it? No. In fact, he says specifically in there, it's not just because we feel like it that we become a country. There are reasons. And basically, it was like complaints. They said that Britain had violated what's called, uh, what they called their inalienable rights. So if you look on here, this is some famous, uh, the beginning of the Declaration of Independence. This is where he's borrowing ideas from John Locke, the guy on the way on the right. Basically, it's almost like cutting and pasting uh, ideas from John Locke's treatise on government. Okay. And at the top, I put two bullets kind of summarizing some of the ideas, and then we can actually read it. But in it, so Jefferson, by the way, was the only person who wrote it. He was a one man paper. Okay? The Declaration of Independence was a one man job. The Constitution later, which is the rules for the United States, that's a multi person job, but this is a one person job. Um, he said that the power of government comes from the people. That's a new idea. You know, because all these European governments like England and France and everything, their idea was that there's kings and then the kings are basically like the reason they're king is because God said so. You know, same thing in China, ancient China, it's called the mandate of heaven. You know, the idea that there was a divine mandate or rule, or an order that, that that king represents. And then everyone is supposed to kind of fall in line under that. This is turning it upside down like this and saying that the power of government isn't that God gave us the king and the king tells us what to do and organize his life. It's that the people have the power, right? That God gives people inalienable rights, right? God gives people rights that you can't take away. So God, does, it's not just the king, but God gives the people, everybody, these inalienable rights. And that the people make governments in order to protect those rights, right? So what are, for Jefferson, he's saying, what are governments? Governments are like, Groups of people, almost like remember the charters we talked about, the charter the first companies. There are groups of people who come together to protect their rights. That's what a government is. Okay, whose rights? Well, the rights that God gave us. So these are very famous uh, uh, beginning to the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident, meaning I don't even need to explain them because I mean, they already should be obvious that all men are created equal. And that they are endowed by their creator 
were certain inalienable rights. Inalienable means you literally, you know, not like an alien from space, but uh, a lien, to put a lien on something means that you have a right to take that away. Like somebody puts a, a bank, puts a lien on your house. That means if you don't pay, they can take your house, right? But this is, it literally means the old way of saying it, unalienable, meaning it can, you cannot you cannot be taken away from you. And then among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure, I'll explain that what he means by that in a second. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. So we make governments to secure life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness for everybody. That's why we make governments. Deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, meaning the people have to actually give permission to the government to be the government. And here we go. This is why they had a revolution. That whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it's the right of the people to alter or abolish it and to institute a new government, laying its foundation on such principles that are most likely to affect their safety and happiness. So, in other words, if the government's job is to specifically, the only reason the government's even there in the first place is because people make them to protect our rights. So the second part, if it turns out that the government is actually somehow destroying people's rights, right, destructive of these ends, then it's the right of the people to get rid of that government. You have a right to throw off that government and get a new one. That's what he's saying. He goes on to say that you don't do that lightly. It's not something you do every week. You just start tossing off governments like it's a new flavor of the ice cream. He says, you only do it when there's a serious breach and it's just like there's nothing else you can do. And then the rest of the document, he lists all these things that Britain had done as a uh, list of grievances, basically, you know, all the things. And then says, you know, Britain, Britain basically drove us to this point. We have no other choice but to um, throw off that government and form a new one. Okay. So that's his idea. The governments are made from the people. And he wrote the, that was published on 4th of July. 1776. And that's why today on the 4th of July, you see fireworks in with the national holiday in the United States, Independence Day. So let's put that another way. Um, if the oldest, remember we saw the feudal system at the beginning of this class, right? And we talked about humanism as an individual. In a way, the United States is based on, on Renaissance humanism, or Enlightenment humanism. Okay, Because if the old aristocratic system said that, okay, Governments up here are made because God gives that king authority, and then the king obeys God, and everybody else obeys the king. It's like a chain, right? Then these guys don't have a whole lot of say in anything down at the bottom. But the new U.S. government was saying, no, no, no. These people down here, all these guys at the bottom, or everybody in general, they're all up here in this big blob up to the top. And God gives not just the king, God gives them, everybody, inalienable natural rights. And not just the king, but their job is to obey God. And how to do that, how to protect those, those rights, they make governments. They make constitu A constitution is like the rules for government. And in the case of the United States, they made a new type of government, which had three branches. Okay, So it's basically what we're talking about in a second. They flipped it upside down. Instead of just God giving a... a uh, you know, a nation, a king, and then everyone else falling under it. It's God giving rights to everyone and then everyone making the government, theoretically. Um, how does that work exactly? Well, what's what's unique about the U.S. government from the start, a lot of people don't realize this, uh, what's so unusual about it, is that no other government before in history that had these three branches like this uh, had separated it out. It was done in theory and in, in uh, by Montesquieu, a French uh, Enlightenment author who wrote a book called The, the Spirit of the Laws, Esprit du Loi. But in practice, no one had ever done it like this. Some governments in like ancient times, like Sparta and Greece and stuff, they had like different branches, but it wasn't complete like this, okay? So they basically took French Enlightenment structure from Montesquieu and put it into action. Uh, remember we said Jefferson spoke French, loved all things French, visited France, was the ambassador to France, did all kinds of stuff. He had his French friend design Washington, D.C., all that. So I knew a lot of things about France. Um, the three branches of government in the U.S., which are now copied around the world, basically, is the legislative branch, or the Congress, which makes the laws, 
right? The executive branch headed by the president, which enforces the laws, which is a huge task with all kinds of agencies like the FBI and the State Department and all that. And then lastly, and this was the most unusual one, the judicial branch, meaning what was unusual was unique about America. And some people say it was the most unique thing about the United States founding, was that they took the judicial branch, the judges and the courts, and they separated it out as a separate branch, okay, to interpret the laws. So one makes the laws, one enforces the laws, and one interprets the laws. And by interpret, what the Supreme Court, for example, does is they say whether a law can be constitutional or not. So in other words, if the Congress makes a law and then a court case comes up about that law, the Supreme Court can say that law is not constitutional. It doesn't follow the Constitution, the rules of the country, and they have to get rid of the law. Okay, so amazingly, the courts actually have power over Congress, but then Congress has certain powers over the courts, like approving Supreme Court nominees. Okay, so we call that a process of checks and balances. That's another unique thing about the United States. Is they, they came up with this process where each of these branches would have a way to push the other ones, push back against the other ones. And this was the key to what they call the separation of powers. They, they thought we can't let any one branch have all the power. Because that if you read the Federalist Papers, that's they say that is the problem is that whenever you have a government, one branch always tends to grab power. And we know that. We know that. Remember we said that the United States comes from, uh, a lot of the ideas come from John Locke, who was an empiricist, meaning he, he didn't have an ideal version of a perfect person in his mind. He said, look, in the real world, people aren't perfect. Okay, they're not perfect. So we know people are always going to grab for power. What can we do about that? Well, we can allow them to push against each other, these different branches. And somehow... By pushing back against each other, they can um, have a balance, a balance of powers between them, separation of powers. Okay, it doesn't know the, the, the problem with that, there's also a flip side to that. The problem with that, which we see a lot, is that yes, there's a balance of power, but if everybody is pushing back against everybody, it can get so slow that nothing gets done. See what I'm saying? That's the advantage that dictatorships have, have or one party systems like China. The, the advantage there is that um, they don't have all the checks and balances. They, they do actually do have some with the inside of the Communist Party, but but a lot less. You know, like the Xi Jinping, for example, can just do a lot of things on his own. that Nobody can stop him. And uh, the advantage is that they can move quicker on things. Dictatorships can always move faster than democracies, you know. So it's a, each one has its own strengths. All right. Um Okay, so just remember the Constitution is the it's a big it's a document that's a really great it's a it's a masterwork. It's one of the great political documents of all time. And it's the outline for the US government and it's copied around the world by many countries. Okay, the, the system. And the Declaration of Independence is also one of the great political documents of all time because it basically not only declares independence, it explains the relationship between human beings and governments, what we call the social contract. Right, that we make a government, a, people make a contract with the government to do certain things. And if that government doesn't do those things, we have a right to make another government. All right, let's move forward. Um, what about these other countries in Europe? What's happened on those guys and their colonies and all this? Well, right after the American Revolution in 1776, um, remember that a lot of those ideas came from France and England. The French basically were partly inspired by the Americans. They had the first revolution in Europe, okay? Meaning like getting rid of kings. First time they got rid of the kings and the, and the czars and all that was, was the French, the French Revolution in 1789, okay? Um, they started to chop people's heads off, right? Just chop the king, the queen, all these different people's heads off. And uh, all the aristocracy, the old order of who was in charge. And they tried to put it in democracy, but it got very, very messy and it wasn't smooth at all. So France... <laughs> France basically went through almost another hundred years of just chaos and a lot of difficulty. Okay. It wasn't like, like in the United States, they declared independence, but today we still have the same constitution in the United States that we did in 1776, same, same rules. France, a different story. France got rid, partly because it already had a government before that was much more stable and much more, had been there for a long time. It's hard to get rid of that stuff. 
So they had many, many different attempts at new types of governments, many revolutions after the French Revolution that went on and on and on and were a big mess. Um, but within a decade or so of the French Revolution, there was such chaos that people were looking for somebody to take control, right? It was called the Reign of Terror. It was a period afterwards of people were getting executed, you know, for being associated with the, with the monarchy. And people got tired of that. They said, can somebody take control of this country? And what often happens when things are out of control is that people look to a military leader because at least they can like enforce control. They can get this thing under control. And the, the problem is the military leaders all don't always have a lot of knowledge about politics. Sometimes they do, but they can at least have control of the country. And so that's what happened in France. Uh, a guy named Napoleon, who was famous, who was very short. Uh, Napoleon uh, was a military general who was a very successful general, and he was able to get all his forces behind him and take over France. In fact, here's the French. They took over all this stuff. We talked about Flanders, Belgium, and all this, the Netherlands. Took over Germany. Took over Spain. It was called the Peninsular War, because Spain's a peninsula. Took over large parts of Italy. All this green stuff, and then even the purple stuff was allied with the point. This is a very like short-lived French empire, well, a couple of decades. Okay. And that process is called the Napoleonic Wars. Okay. And basically, Napoleon was trying to take over Europe. He was like this power hungry guy, just going to, didn't know when to stop. Ultimately, he got stopped. And, um, you know, he tried to invade Russia, it didn't work. And Russia's freezing in wintertime, it's really far away. And eventually, he got thrown in prison. He escaped. And then he caught him again. He got thrown back in prison again, died. All right. So, so, he was just kind of like nothing but pure sort of lust for more territory. He went, and he had it for a little bit, but didn't last very long. Okay, but these are called the Napoleonic Wars. And the reason I'm telling you this is because, especially because all these wars, this is in Spain right here, uh, the French attacking the Spanish, all these wars absorbed all the energy and the money and the soldiers of all these European countries that we've been talking about. Okay, so in other words, Spain had difficulty controlling its colonies in Latin America because it's busy getting blasted by Napoleon's forces in Europe. And the same thing with Britain. Britain was never taken over by Napoleon. They were the major opponent of Napoleon, actually. Um, part of the, what, what led to his downfall. But they did get attacked by Napoleon and had to get absorbed by that, uh, their energy and their money. So um, their blood and treasure, as they said, their soldiers and their money. So... Um, what we're about to see is that because of, partly because of this, it led sort of a domino effect of a lot of these colonies in the New World, which became independent in the early 20th century because the, the mother countries couldn't handle them anymore. Starting with um, in France itself, okay? Like, remember, actually, we talked about how uh, the United States bought French Louisiana, the giant middle of the United States from water from France. It was Napoleon that sold it because he, he just wanted the cash to fund these wars. Okay, so Napoleon sold what's now the middle of the United States to Thomas Jefferson for cash, okay, 1803. Um, the following year, after the Louisiana Purchase, it's called, was the Haitian Revolution in 1804, the first revolution outside of the United States in the Americas, first first successful revolution. Okay, so where is Haiti? Haiti is one part of uh, two two countries on an island. Whoops, lost it. Okay, on the Caribbean, that is here's Florida right here is Miami. Okay, and there's Cuba and there's this big island. This is where Columbus first landed. Remember, Hispaniola, this island, and this is the Dominican Republic, and this is Haiti over here. Okay, that's Haiti, and Haiti was French. The vast majority of people there are African, black African, and they had a successful, you see, revolution. The guys chopped his head off over here, right? Got rid of the rulers. And the leader is a famous guy named Toussaint Louverture. He's right? a, a black French speaking leader of Haiti. And that was the beginning of modern Haiti, right? So Haiti was the first successful revolution. And why? Partly because uh, France was so absorbed in these Napoleonic Wars, trying to take over Europe. Didn't have time for the colonies. Um, we could go through every single one of these, but I'll just give you one more of what happened, the, the dominoes, all these 
colonies slowly but surely became independent. The first one in the Spanish-speaking world well, colonies was uh, what we call Colombia, or it became Gran Colombia. In other words, what we call today Venezuela, Colombia, and Ecuador. These three countries today uh, be, fought for their independence, <clears throat> led by this Venezuelan guy named Simon Bolivar, <clears throat> who's a super famous figure all throughout Latin America. He's sort of like the George Washington of, of Latin America, the freedom fighter, the liberator, the liberador. And they successfully fought off the Spanish and created Gran Colombia, this giant um, new nation down here. And remember, if we talked about how there was all these you know, sort of racial hierarchies and everything like that, and if you were, even if you were white in that hierarchy, you couldn't be at the top in the Spanish colonies if you were born in the new world, you were called a criollo, like a like a like a mix or or, or, a, or a new a new world guy. You're 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 a new world person, even if you're from Spanish blood. And they are part of the leaders of this revolution because they were like, how come we're fully Spanish, but just because I'm born in Colombia, I can't be a leader of Colombia? You know, it's got to be a guy from Spain. Like, doesn't make any sense to me. So they were they were some of the people who led, who led those revolutions. By the way, what you see in this picture on the right is Simon Bolivar receiving a flag, of uh, Spanish flag, from a British guy. Why a British guy? Because there were these volunteers called the British Legions, volunteers from Britain, who uh, kind of like you yeah, have volunteers right now are going to Ukraine to fight the Russians. Um, volunteer soldiers. Some some British guys went to Latin America just to fight, just just for just cause, <laughs> uh, just to help out the Spanish uh, to rebel against the. Uh, I mean, helped out the uh, Colombians and Latin America uh, fight the Spanish. Okay, and so little by little, these other countries later, um, Peru, Brazil, all these guys will later become independent as well. And finally, Mexico, et cetera, et cetera. Well, let's flip to, um, remember the 1800s, we can call this an age of revolutions. What about the Industrial Revolution? Well, in the Industrial Revolution, you had the steam engine was invented, the of factory systems using modern machines. Uh, there was a spree of canal building where you could connect things by transport really fast. All this happened in Britain. In Britain, Britain was the the pioneer of the Industrial Revolution. Not just Britain, but specifically, not even London. It was more like Lower Scotland and Northern England, like where Manchester is and Liverpool. If you're wondering why Manchester has such great soccer teams, it's probably because they had so much money, because they were the first industrialized city in the world. Okay, Manchester and Lower Scotland. Why there? Because there was a lot of coal there, a lot of coal in rivers. And so you could dig up iron and you had to use, use coal to, to uh, heat up the iron to make steel. And you had a lot of coal. See all this stuff up here? These industrial areas, the white stuff is where the coal was. Okay, so these are the world's first industrial areas. And Britain became the workshop of the world, you know? So now we people say, oh, it's everything's made in China. But back then it was everything's made in Britain. Right? Because they were the only ones who had machines for a long time. And remember, we said they'd take cotton from the New World or from India, send it into those machines. Those machines would make all kinds of fancy stuff or clothes and then send it back to the colonies. Okay, the workshop of the world. Um, later, the U.S. became, you know, made in the USA, became a great thing uh, big in, the, in the 80s and 70s. And then now it's made in China. So it keeps moving around. Um, that Industrial Revolution then spread. But... Britain had a monopoly on it for a hundred years. It's very important to understand. That's one of the reasons Britain got way ahead of everybody else, because they had a monopoly on those machines, those factories and everything for about a hundred years. Only later, you know, that was in the 1700s. Only later in the mid 1800s did France and Germany and these guys, Belgium, then get into the act. And then only even later, and also the United States too. And finally, like other countries like Spain, Italy, Portugal, et cetera, eventually became industrialized as well, but still are a couple steps behind. Okay, so the Industrial Revolution, Britain had a monopoly on it for a century. And that was the height of the British Empire under the Victorian age. Um, here are some of those things, right, that were part of the Industrial Revolution. Um, steam trains were invented in Britain. Um, steam ships, which later were invented in the United States. And it became very famous to have steamship rides up and down the Mississippi River. That's some of the most famous, you know, children's books that we read in school, like Huckleberry Finn and Tom Sawyer. 
about uh, these kids who get on steamboats and they go on these adventures up and down the Mississippi. Um, okay, and then building canals. There was this canal mania period in, in Britain where people started building canals like crazy. And the canals allowed you to just have horses on either side attached to the, the barge or the boat in the middle and just drag it along. And it was like effortless. You could just huge, heavy stuff. You could just drag it right down the water in the canal. It was, they thought it was amazing. Okay, so there's a transportation revolution going on within the Industrial Revolution. Things are moving far and they're moving fast, okay, including people, stuff, but also people. That's going to lead to um, where the, these, these revolutions right here, right? Let's think, think, step back before we think about this. The Industrial Revolution, okay, steam engines, factories, machines, and canals. And then transportation is increasing, canals steamships, steam trains, things are moving very fast. And by the way, these steamships would get to be huge, like steam battleships, eventually. Okay, the the, the, the uh, U.S. Civil War was, uh, a big part of it was these giant iron-sided ships, which they've never seen before. There's always wooden ships before. And this is going to lead into, as we kind of wrap up this class, right, um, going into the next one, uh, the 1800s, are going to be, that we just kind of got our feet wet in, um, are going to be a century of mass movements, okay, migrations of people, mass migrations like this. See on the right? These are immigrants coming to America, right? People from Italy, from Spain, from Ireland, et cetera, et cetera. Um, coming to see that Statue of Liberty in New York City, right? It's, uh, that's actually a gift of the French, actually. The Statue of Liberty was given to the U.S. by the French. Um Okay, mass movements, mass movements. Um, I mean, not just political movements, I mean actual movements of people, like from point A to point B, right? Uh, take a look at the right. This is the United States. Remember, we started off with 13 colonies. Well, how did we get 50 states? Well, because people went west. Okay, so there was this idea called manifest destiny uh, that was popular during the 1800s. Manifest destiny. These are, these are people, I'll explain that in a second. These are people who are pioneers, are moving westward. They're going to occupy the western parts of the United States. Um, what are they bringing with them? Well, they're bringing their farming techniques. You know, they see the plow and all this stuff over here. They're bringing their um, Bible, right? their religion with them. They're Christianized, everyone else. They're bringing electrical lines. See this? <laughs> right? They're going to electrify the Western United States, they're going to religify it, you know, they're going to farmify it, right? they're going to put agriculture out there, modern agriculture, all these things. Now, was this an easy, smooth process? No, there were a lot of horrible battles between Native Americans and settlers. Um, a lot of atrocities were done on all sides. It was a very wild, wild west, you know, wild, difficult place. And they encountered a lot of wild animals, like some of them you see here running, the bears and the deer. Okay, but, and there's the buffalo running too. And look at the train in the back. Right? We said trains, right? Steam trains. And there it comes right there, the railroad. So these are all things that are part of this giant movement to the West. And finally, they got to California. And we had the gold rush, a uh, period in 1849, uh, when somebody has discovered gold. And all of a sudden, all these people, oh, I got gold. And went out to the West trying to find gold. Okay, that, that's another big magnet drawing people out to the West. Okay, a lot of people died along the way, too. Some brutal conditions, very difficult conditions. It wasn't easy to farm in the middle of the United States because it's very dry. And um, so it was very difficult. Okay, the, why is it called manifest destiny, this, this concept? Because manifest means like something is plain and clear, like clear, like it's obvious, you can see it. And destiny, right? It's, it's our, we're, we're destined to do something. It's our fate. And so the idea at the time was that it is the obvious destiny, the manifest destiny, the obvious destiny of America is to go from coast to coast, right? That was the idea at the time, that the country should go from the East Coast and expand all the way to the West. That somehow this was obvious, okay? And that's what they did. Um, take a look at the left. Talk, speaking about mass movements, one of the things that enabled this mass movement was the Transcontinental Railroad, okay, which had different lines to it. But you see uh, on the left, the Transcontinental Railroad had many branches, 
And you can see in the middle there, there's the Central Pacific, okay, the Central Pacific Railroad. Uh, whoops, sorry, hold on. Which is the green. Everyone see this? Central Pacific. And then close to where you guys up here is the Northern Pacific. And then down here, Southern Pacific. And then Union Pacific coming from east to west. Now, what about this? Well, this is important because why are there two lines here? Because the Rocky Mountains go like this. Okay, so there's a giant, the biggest mountains in the United States are right through here like this. So that's why they had to build this side from the west coast. And then they built this way across this relatively easy flat area in the middle here. And met them here at what's called Promontory Point. See, it says Promontory Point. That's where the two rail met. And then they finally put the last track in there. And then they created the Transcontinental Railroad in the U.S. That's a major achievement. Okay, connecting the U.S. coast to coast. It's in the middle of the 1800s. Um, you know who built a lot of these railroads, actually, but you know who built the vast majority of the transcontinental, this, the Central Pacific part of this transcontinental railroad? Chinese workers. Chinese, I told you I was going to end with China. Okay? Chinese workers, the vast majority of the workers on Central Pacific Railroad. And, and a lot of the other ones, too. Um, they were the ones who built this part that you see in green because two couple of things. A, China's on this side. So, you know, you, if you come to San Francisco, uh, actually this, this line started in Sacramento, not that far from San Francisco. So they come into San Francisco, they get on the job and they go to like this. And Chinese workers were some of the only ones who, want, who would do the work through the mountains. It's very difficult. They had to basically dynamite and explode their way through the mountains to get these, um, to get the rail. You put a railway through the mountain, through the Rocky Mountains. It's not easy to do. You kind of see that in the back. See the slopes? It's a very difficult work. And the Chinese workers were so good at it that they became known for this. They, they went all over the United States building railroads. They built railroads um, all the way out to Boston and New York City. Uh, and just they, they built railroads all over the place, like local railroads, transcontinental railroads. They built all kinds of stuff. Okay. In fact, that's how a lot of the Chinese ended up in Boston, Chinatown in Boston or New York City, Boston town, but, uh, Chinatown. That's, they ended up there not only, but often through working on railroad projects. And then they settled there, they had a restaurant or they did something else once they got there or whatever. Okay, so it's a major, major contribution to, uh, to America. And, um, and they didn't all speak Mandarin, by the way. They, they're from different parts of China. There's some language dialect called Taishan. Uh, do you know this language, the Taishanese? Have you ever heard of that before? Taishanese is a type of Chinese that's spoken like, uh, I forget what the name of the, it's about several hundred miles west of Guangdong. It's another, another province. Um, okay, so uh, at the end here, this is the painting that I saw in a museum a couple of years ago, actually during COVID. I was in the United States, I was in Indiana. And uh, I, I like the painting, so I thought of it and I put it in here, okay? It's a painting, it's, it's, a, it's by a modern painter. His name is Mien Situ, I guess I didn't pronounce that, but um, it's called The Golden Mountain, arriving in San Francisco in, um, in 1800, which I can't even read that, 1805 or 1803, because that's underneath my little, my little uh, control board here. But you can see these are Chinese migrants, and you can see they still have the, Qing Dynasty uh, hair, you know, the men of the Qing, this is back before the Sun Yat-sen, before the revolution, before China became a democracy, back in the 1800s, right? Um, and let me see what point year that is, hold on. 1865, sorry, I had to unshare to be able to see it. I said 18 something, 1865, right? So this is right after the gold rush and right about the time that the Transcontinental Railroad was being built. And just like so many other Americans, just like these other Americans from Europe over here, they're coming to America for opportunity, right? To get land and freedom and uh, be able to start a business, start a new life, to come here for the American dream, right? That you can go from rags to riches. You can, if you just work hard, play by the rules, that you can make something out of your life, right? So that's what they're for. So he's basically trying to show 
uh, here's an American captain, I guess here. So all these guys, they're kind of looking out on this uh, ocean and what they're seeing on the other side, you barely see it in the background is San Francisco, San Francisco, California, which has, you know, California, San Francisco has a major Chinese communities that date back for um, hundreds of years. Okay. All right. So we can leave that there. And uh, that's kind of wrapping, you know, the early modern period, which leads into the modern period. And one of the things I like about this period that we just did is that it's a lot of things that are sort of like the, the very, very basics, you know, the, the, uh, the beginnings of the world that we know around us now. Like, how did it get there? You know, it's, it's, in other words, it's close enough to us in history that we can uh, see it now today. We still see the things, you know, it's not so far back where it's like so remote, but uh, we see it all around us. All right, so we can see the ideas of the modern world coming through. Okay, I think that's it, guys. Um, like I said, we can pick this up in the next session, but uh, it was great talking to you guys and have a great rest of your summer. Bye-bye.